Welcome everybody to Pub 101. I'm Karen and this is our third meeting. You will recall last week we were here with Karen Bjork and we talked about calls for proposals and next week we're going to talk about MOUs and right in the middle of that we're going to take a step back from acronyms and forms and take a more holistic look at what kind of publishing support that you may have the capacity to offer at your institution. Today we are lucky to be joined by Amanda Larson, who is Affordable Learning Consultant at Ohio State University. Amanda is going to frame the discussion of whether you're supporting open textbook publishing at a pro project or a program level based on your, both your individual and your organizational capacity. Now, of course, I would just like to point out, as I'm sure um, all of you are aware from your work experience, it may start out that you think of it as supporting a faculty member with a project and then you turn around a little bit later and you're like, wait a minute, do we have a program going here? <laughs> what, what do we have on our hands? So to get us started, I'm going to do a poll so that Amanda and I can see where all of you are at. Um, you should see it on your screen now. Send me a signal if you don't. The first question, how many people will be supporting OER publishing at your location? It could be zero. You might be here um, just to learn and that's fine. Uh, it could be really robust, three or more people. Let us know. Second question, if you're responsible for supporting OER publishing, is it an official part of your job description? Yes, no, I'm not sure about that. I haven't looked at my job description in a while and maybe my job has totally changed anyway because everything in life is so different now. Number three, do you plan on teaching publishing technologies to faculty, for example, maybe hosting a Pressbooks workshop? Yes, no, not sure. And number four, will you consider the OER you support to be reflections of your organization or institution? So in other words, are you approaching this as this is this faculty member's product or we're really supporting faculty and so this is both a reflection of their work and our work and the institution's work that's what i'm trying to get at with that question um, is your um, organizational logo perhaps you know in the corner of of this resource um, so it looks like you've all had a little chance to respond i'll give it five more seconds and then end the poll 83% of you have voted. It's pretty, pretty good. And now I'm sharing. So you should be viewing those results. We're kind of right down the right down the middle between 0, 1, 2, 3 in terms of how many people are supporting OER. Same thing. If you're responsible for supporting OER publishing, is it a part of your job description? Kind of in the middle. Almost half of you, yes, half of you no. Do you plan on teaching publishing technologies? Okay, this one, most of you are saying either yes or I don't know. And then finally, yes, a lot of you are thinking this is going to be a reflection of our organization as well as the individual faculty member. So that's really helpful and, and interesting. Thank you. So um, before I turn things over to Amanda, I am going to um, ask you to just kind of do another really short thinking exercise similar to what we tried last week with Karen Bjork when you um, thought about your your dating profile or your matchmaking tool for call for proposals and this is a design thinking exercise it's meant to be really fast and imaginative it doesn't need to be perfect it doesn't even need to be in complete sentences I'm just gonna ask you to explore two questions together in a group for about three minutes each. So it'll go really fast. You guys won't be able to dig too deeply. Um, but I will give you a second for introductions and I'll send you little reminders so you know kind of where you're at time-wise um, when you're in those breakout groups. So you don't need to worry about your timing. All right, so the first question you're going to explore together is the nightmare scenario. What could go very wrong when supporting OER publishing? What might that mean for you, for the author, for students, your library, the institution? Just go dark, total disaster, use comedy, um, nobody's listening, uh, the breakout rooms are not recorded. 
And then you'll kind of get out all of these um, fears, which can be really liberating when starting to imagine um, new programs and um, what you want them to look like. And then we'll go, we'll flip things to the sunny side. And it, the next three minutes in your breakout groups, you'll be looking at what could go so very right with your OER publishing support. Dream big. What might that mean for you, for students, the author, your institution? Again, feel free to be a little silly. Imagine something insanely wonderful. Um, and then we'll regroup and, um, and start talking about this a little bit more uh, sort of middle of the road with Amanda. Now, um, bonus points. Um, it is borrowing a principle from improvisation. And instead of, you know, sort of listening to somebody's idea and then sort of drawing a line and then coming up with your own idea, you could try sort of building. And so, yes, and. So if someone says, you know, um, we're short staffed and we don't realize it, but we publish an OER and it's actually all been plagiarized. And someone could say, yes, and the original author found it and we heard from their lawyers. Yes, and the lawyers, you know, but I don't want to put too many rules on you guys, but that's just an idea. If you're feeling adventurous, I'm just trying to, to shake things up so that um, you feel free to experiment in your breakout groups. So I'll also copy and paste those questions um, into your breakout rooms so that you don't have to try and remember what it is I just said. Um, and if you have any questions, let me know. Any questions? Check in the chat. Okay, I appreciate your willingness to experiment here. And I'm going to send you into the breakout rooms now. And welcome back, everybody. I hope that that was a fun experiment. Again, it can be really useful to do that kind of brainstorming before you embark on a project or a program, because it gives everybody permission to share their fears or their worst case scenarios or what they think is going to go wrong with this particular project and just kind of get everything out there. So, um, Without further ado, I would like to turn, turn things over to Amanda, and this will ensure that we have time for conversation and questions with her following her presentation, and perhaps um, we'll be able to hear uh, a little bit about what happened in the breakout rooms. If not, feel free to extend the conversation in our class notes. Um, that is an actively maintained space, and Karen Bjork replied uh, to a couple questions from last week. So that's always a place we can go if we are unable to fit everything into this short hour together. So thank you for that, and without further ado, over to you, Amanda. Awesome. I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Right. So we're going to talk today about individual and organizational capacity in context of publishing programs. And um, I'm going to start just by telling you a little bit about me and sort of my path to this land. Um, so I started getting interested in publishing when I was in grad school the first time around for uh, literature. I had a position as the editorial assistant at the Journal of Narrative Theory and we started getting um, queries from authors about could they put their articles inside their institutional repositories and we didn't have a policy on that at, at the time and so we started thinking about that and I started thinking about what it meant to publish research openly and then when I was in grad school the second time I was the Open Educational Resources Teaching Assistant at UW-Madison and um, was really introduced to this world of open education and thinking about what publishing might look like. Um, there, it was a real grassroots effort. It was just me and Steel Wagstaff against the world. 
And um, we had really great faculty who were super interested in publishing because in a lot of their disciplines, there weren't textbooks, or if there were, they were really expensive. So for example, we worked a lot with foreign languages, particularly Hindi and Tibetan come to mind, um, also Swahili. And um, we also worked with folks who had really expensive uh, science textbooks. So thinking about like all the stuff that goes into biology and, and anatomy books. Um, and I sort of fell in love with the work there. And then I graduated and was like, well, I wanna do this for forever. I wanna work with faculty and do open educational resources work. And luckily for me, there were jobs to be able to do that. And so I, my first position was as the open education librarian at Penn State. And um, there I co-led an affordability program which offered grants to faculty to create or adapt open textbooks. Um, and since then I have moved on to become the affordable learning instructional consultant at Ohio State. And my role now is working both with faculty um, and I'm sorry, my dog just jumped in front of me as being really cute and sneezing. So I apologize if you can hear her. Um, and so I work with faculty and who are participating in the Affordable Learning Exchange, which is run by Ashley Miller. And they've had a very well-established publishing program. And I also work in the libraries thinking about like, how do I teach other librarians about open educational resources and open pedagogy? And then how can we teach faculty about open pedagogy. So it's allowing me to work more closely with faculty than I did at Penn State. But I'm still connected to a publishing program of some sort. So when I think about publishing programs, I think that there are really two approaches. Um, one is uh, do it yourself. Oh, she's going to make an appearance. <laughs> Uh, one is the do-it-yourself, one person or small teams. And um, it's really important when you're working at a small team level to figure out really what you have the capacity to support. Because if you're the only one doing the work, you can get bogged down really fast if you don't sort of outline a structure for yourself. And then the second one is sort of thinking it as a publishing program that's going to offer a suite of services to faculty. So a lot of these bullets will match up. Like they both need to identify the support. You both need to figure out what the expectations are, what clear communication will look like, and then what models you're going to do. So in a do-it-yourself, version, you're probably going to do a lot of teach the teacher. So you're going to learn a technology potentially, and then you're going to show faculty how to use it, and then maybe support them using that technology. So for an example of that, when I was at UW-Madison, we had press books, we had that access to that through the Unison Consortium. And so that was the tool that we used to publish with. And my role was to work one on one with faculty to identify what their textbook needs were, and then basically give them like the tour of press books, give them a little bit of training, send them away, let them play with it like a sandbox and figure out how it worked for their needs and then bring it back if they had questions. Whereas in a larger publishing service, you might have somebody who does sort of that production work for the faculty member, which was the case at Penn State. We had two instruction production specialists who put all of the stuff into press books for faculty and um, did a lot of that really heavy lifting of like building the thing. And then I think at either version, you're going to want to build a community. And then um, one thing that I always think about in this work is how can we continue to um, take care of ourselves while we're doing this work. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So identifying support. Um, and when I'm thinking about this, it's it's what do you have, what services do you have the capacity are willing to support? Um, so it could be that at your institution, the only thing you can really support at this time is helping faculty identify and curate OER. Maybe you don't have time to like work with them on brand new works. So you're just working on adapting and remixing works. Um, but maybe you do have capacity to author new works and thinking through what that looks like and what your support will be. Um, what tools can you offer to faculty to create or remix work? So there are lots of different places that OER can live. Um, Pressbooks is an example that I've used, but I think Manifold would work, Scribe through Pub, 
the pub co-op here is also a great tool. Um, OER can live inside the learning management system. And then where do you host the content when it's done? Um, is it going to go into an institutional repository at your institution? Are you going to put it on OER Commons? Is it just going to be hosted on the web? Or maybe it will just live inside the LMS. So thinking about identifying support, going through the do-it-yourself model first, um, I think that the one thing you'd want to identify right away is are your publishing efforts supported through administration? So do you have admin support? And that can look like a lot of different things. Are they okay with you talking to people about OER? Or have they signed like an inclusive access deal and would rather that you didn't do that? Um, or is it a grassroots campaign where you're just going to work with faculty who are interested who've maybe come to you for the support and you're just offering it as a point of service. Um, administration might support might also mean there's money for OER um, and that can look like it's a lot of different things. It could look like getting you more help. So maybe you could hire a student to work on it. Um, or maybe you can offer stipends to faculty for participating. Um, is it just you supporting all of the OER publishing efforts at that institution? Is it a small team? Um, so like for Steele and I, it was just the two of us. And then after I graduated, he was able to secure funding for another OER teaching assistant. Um, so there were still two people able to work on it at the time. Um, are there a few collaborators you can lean on? So are there people who have expertise that can help you? Um, and that can be anything from um, people who are familiar with HTML, who could maybe look at some CSS for you. And then also thinking about like, can you get a student worker? Could you secure a teaching assistantship for a graduate student? Um, could you hire copy editors if like everything is ready and set to go, but you just need somebody to do that look and that's not the last look over and it's not in your skill set. Now for a publishing program, this looks a little different because it's going to be probably a much broader uh, program. It's going to have more reach. So administrative, which administrators are supporting this effort? If you have a program, it is probably it's supported by some administrator somewhere, whether it's just within the library or maybe larger, um, and that would be institutional support. So does the support come from the top down? So president, then the provost, or then the unit? Or does the support just come from specific units? So the difference that this could look like, so at Penn State, um, all of our initiatives were provost funded and had provost backing. He really cares about affordability. But I have seen other instances where it's just coming out of maybe teaching and learning. Um, financial, where's the money coming from? It's always good to figure out that out right away. Where's the money coming from? And then who's on the team? Who's doing the day-to-day -day work? Who's doing sort of like the reporting of numbers up to the administration? Um, and then who's working sort of on the ground, hands-on with faculty? So identifying partners, this is going to look different in both contexts. So I would say that you probably want to build at the institutional level a working group of stakeholders. And you'll notice that I put students on there first. Um, it's really important to have student perspective as you sort of build these programs out because the materials are meant for student use. And so it's really great to get their perspective. Um, and then libraries, the Center for Teaching and Learning, this might be called something else where you're at. Um, it could be faculty, the bookstore, your academic press, um, academic units, or institution-specific units could have an interest in this. So for example, um, it could be like instructional designers would be a great fit. And you're going to really want to define expectations. So once you've identified what and how you can support a publishing effort. Um, so we're just going to help people adapt books and we're going to do it in one specific tool. That's an expectation. You want to make sure that you set that expectation for your faculty authors and also outline what support that they can expect from you. And I would say remember this because next week you're going to be talking about the MOU and that's where this really ties in with setting those expectations from the starting point. Um, so like it's great to get it in writing, but it absolutely can be iterative and grow with your initiative. 
Um, and also when you're thinking about getting that support in writing, um, it can change from program year to program year. In fact, I probably suggest that it should, like you should be learning things from your first trial and errors and then editing them to make it better the next time around. So what that looked like in my experience was the first time around, we just had an MOU that had people assign which Creative Commons license that they were interested in using. They weren't being tied to that for forever, so they could change their mind, but they had to at least select one to start from. And then they had to have somebody in their upper chain of their administration sign off on knowing that they were doing it. And then that changed around so that by the third time we were ready to offer the grants at Penn State, like they had to pick a license and were hopefully it would be one of two. And we were only offering one of two because we had found that some of that hellscape came from like letting people just run wild and not really paying attention to what they were curating and making sure that the Creative Commons licenses played well together. So we wanted to like really help them avoid those pitfalls. So we were like, okay, this time you're going to select from one or two licenses and um, you still need your support, but we also want you to give us a work plan so that we know what you plan on working and how that will look to begin with. Then they're going to have to define roles. Who's going to do what? What do the faculty do? What do you do? What do your collaborators do? So where does it make sense to collaborate? If you have access to instructional designers, can they help faculty create learning objectives and goals for the materials so that they're starting from sort of like a point of this is what I want them to get out of it. My students are going to have, meet these learning objectives and they're going to be able to meet them by doing what? Um, and maybe you have other librarians who can help your faculty curate the OER so that you have somebody who has perhaps subject expertise also looking for the OER. Um, in my experience, a lot of people who are stuck doing OER work, I shouldn't say stuck, who get to do OER work, um, often are generalists. And so we don't necessarily have that niche subject knowledge. So it's always nice to bring in a libra another librarian to, to collaborate with. Um, maybe you have students who can advocate with administration for money for your initiative. Um, and I found working with student governments can be very, very beneficial. A lot of times they care about affordability and they're running on like affordability platforms to get elected into those positions. Um, and they really want something practical that they can do. Um, what the opposite side of that is sometimes you may have to rein them in and be like, no, you can't storm faculty senate. That's not how this works. Um, and then also the bookstore can be a good partner depending on your relationship with them. And maybe they can help identify courses or provide print copies of the OER at cost for students who would like that option. Clear communication. <sighs> This can't be stated enough. Um, a lot of your work as a project manager for a program, whether you are doing it by yourself or you're working with a whole lot of collaborators, is going to be about clearly communicating with all of the stakeholders in the publishing initiative. So I would say be as transparent as you can be. So if something is falling apart, you have to be really honest with your stakeholders and be like, this is what's happening. X won't be finished by this time because these things have happened um or it could be like things are going really great we have done x y and z and now we're ready to pay out faculty for this um and i would say create shared language really early if not before you start it might be something that you really start building your program around is like how do we define oer how do we define affordable um what does it mean to be participating in this and then make sure everybody is sort of on board with that same shared language so that you can all talk about it in the same way. Um, create an MOU for authors that clearly details what they are agreeing to do and articulates what you will do to support them and then sit down with them and make them read it and read it with them. Um, communicate regularly with stakeholders. So that could be everything from as like little updates about how the program is going to larger institution wide things like making sure that the if the provost is investing money in the program that you're getting return on investment numbers for student savings to back with them and then communicate regularly with our authors just check in on with them faculty differ some of them will want a lot of hand holding some of them will want to just be like show me how to do the thing i'm going to go do the thing 
and then I will come back to you if I have questions or if it is finished. And so being sure that you're checking in with them will help keep everybody's projects on track. So teach the teacher. If you are in the DIY model, you are probably going to have to do a lot of this. So you need to teach your authors to be self-sufficient and self-starters. So what I mean by that is they have to be able to like actually sit down and make themselves write if they're writing and authoring a textbook. Um, and you can provide training for them with tools and licensing. Um, maybe you want to offer them some information around open pedagogy about how they're going to use that resource in their teaching and then offer support for follow up questions. So make sure that you provide time and place for them to ask questions, to ask each other questions about how they're using the materials or how they're working with a specific tool is always really helpful. Build a community. And I believe this wholeheartedly, it is dangerous to go alone, take a cute kitten with you, um, start really small, particularly if you're in sort of that DIY model, um, support only in these projects as you have time and capacity for, and then grow over time. So it's really okay if you start with just one or two textbook projects and then say, hey, you know what, that went pretty well, let's add one more and then build up your capacity slowly. Um, even if you're starting at sort of the institutional level where you can say, I have $10,000 to give out grants to faculty, um, that doesn't mean that you need to give out all of that money right the second. You could sort of stagger that so that you can work on figuring out what your capacity for supporting those projects is. Um, start, start a community of practice. So I think it's really really can be really, really isolating doing this work, whether you are the person doing the support or you are a, an author working on a book, it can be really isolating. And they're, unless they're already working on a collaborative project, they might feel really alone. Like I have questions, but maybe they're dumb. Nobody else will have them. Um, so I like to always introduce authors to each other. So what that would look like, um, at the program level, say you have a kickoff and you have everybody come in for a day long workshop about getting started on their project and you have them introduce each other, themselves to each other, have them share their projects, discuss what's working and what they're struggling with, maybe at a check in meeting later on and really enable them to not feel alone in the process of creating OER. Um, there are other, also ways that you can help them find collaborators. So like you might leverage the Rebus community to help find people to help them work on that book. But the important thing is just make sure that they know that they're not alone doing this work. So self-care, like I've already mentioned isolation, but I think that there's a lot of invisible and emotional labor that goes into supporting these kind of projects. Um, and it's work that librarians and instructional designers often do that's sort of like invisible and behind the scenes. Um, and it might be a lot of tough conversations, like you might have to email somebody and be like, hey, where's your manuscript? Um, people might be upset at having to use new technologies. There's always some sort of technology fear that I have run into. Um, and helping people work through those can be very draining and emotional. Um, and so when I worked at Penn State, I started and it was really just me by myself. And I was in an office in a tower, literally. Um, and I didn't really interact with my coworkers. I kind of just worked on my grant project. And so like building a community outside of that was really important to me. And you already have a community built in right here. Um, so take, take advantage of that and leverage it. Um, this word can be hard, but it does not have to be hopeless. We've moved from a tower to a lighthouse. Um, so one of the things that I think is really important is sort of building your network and you're doing that already by participating in this. Um, and you'll have people to lean on and ask questions to, and you could just be like, oh, I've had this horrible day this is what happened in my publishing program. And you'll have like a group of people who understand what you're talking about and can really commiserate with you and can sort of like help you work through those issues. Um, but also set boundaries. Um, you don't have to drop everything you're doing to work on that faculty members project right that second. 
um, make sure that everybody is meeting the expectations that we've set for each other. For the tough questions, I find it is really helpful to pre-plan answers. So um, you will get people who will ask you questions about like the efficacy of OER. And um, there's always one curmudgeonly person who's like, I've heard that these are have terrible quality. And um, just have answers ready to answer those kinds of questions. Like just sit down and brainstorm some. And you also don't have to be the master of everything. Um, this is definitely an ex a place where there's a lot of learning on the fly. So don't feel like you have to be the best at every single part of it. It's helpful to know like when to refer to somebody else or when to get help and ask for help from your network of peoples. So considerations to keep in mind. Are there differences between your personal capacity for this work and your organization's capacity? And this might be useful to think about as you're thinking about, do I have a do-it-yourself model? Do I have an institutional model? If I have an institutional model, how does my organization's capacity differ from mine? If I have a do-it-yourself model, my capacity is much more important to what's happening because I'm the only person sort of steering the ship. So figuring out what those differences are can be really useful. And then does your capacity point at a particular publishing approach? So maybe you have capacity to say, get an institutional license for press books and you can support with some press books workshops, but you can't do everything for the faculty member as they're doing it. So it could be like, my personal capacity means that I can give faculty access to a tool, I can teach them how to use a tool, and then they can go create a fantastic thing. And if they have questions, I will try and help answer them. But I'm not going to copy edit their work. I'm not going to like do all of the license checks. Um, there can be some training of that for them. What are you prepared to support right now? So what does the snapshot look like of what your publishing program could look like right now? And then thinking about what you have capacity for right now, how would you like that to grow later? And sitting down and thinking and considering about those is a great place to start as you're sort of planning the program. Um, what conversations do you need to have in your organization to better answer these questions? Um, do you know where your support is coming from? Do you need to identify those stakeholders groups? If so, this is a great time to start figuring out who you need to ask those questions from. And, and then also, what partnerships could you build to make this work easier? Um, do you want to work with your teaching and learning unit in order to help faculty do this kind of work? Um, would partnering with the bookstore help you get print OER into your bookstore for students? Thinking through those partnerships can be really helpful at sort of the beginning stages of thinking about your publishing program. And that's it. We've made it to the last slide. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. Thank you, Amanda. So yeah so um veronica had a great tip in the chat that stressing that open resources used for courses need to have a creative commons license and that that's different from just something you find on the web can be helpful and that is so true i hear time and again that those are also repeated conversations and it's one reason why i think it's really helpful if you are supporting someone on a project to ask to see their first chapter hey what are you working on let me take a look and then you can see, uh oh, you know, I don't know where these images came from, you know, the attribution isn't clear. And so that way you can identify that issue early rather than, you know, 15 chapters later. Um, L, any strategies for including student voices? Previously, we've worked with student representatives who are already involved with campus governance. This opened the door for creating work study opportunities for students, which also increased visibility on the student side of things. Amanda, any thoughts? Yeah, I think it really depends on sort of your institution's context, like everything. Um, but I have found that starting with student government is a great place to start. Um, they will usually have somebody who is really willing to talk to you. And um, 
what how that worked for me in the past is we reached out to student government and said hey would you like to have somebody from your organization serve on the institution-wide open educational resources working group and from there we found out that they had been like working with faculty senate to like try and push through a transparency like clause that people had to disclose how much the co the materials for their courses were going to cost they were trying to work with the registrar to make those appear in sort of like the um system where they sign up for classes and i think that it's probably pretty easy to find they can help you find students if that's difficult um library students already working in the library or in your unit can be a great resource um, and there's lots of different kinds of things that you can do to get them involved. So student government is one avenue, but you could also have them working on the project. Um, we had students who did a lot of um, checking licenses for us um, and also helping faculty uh, curate content was another avenue. Like they could go and do an OER search for them. Um, and just making sure that you're using student voices wisely and really making them feel like it's an engaging experience. Like they're not just there to do a thing for you. Like we also want them to get some education about like copyright and OER so that they understand the work that they're doing. Um, I really believe that all engagements should be student engagement opportunities. So I will not get on my soapbox about that. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda, and thanks to Arnie, who um, is sharing some, some links in the chat about uh, College of the Canyons and um, looking at them as a model for training students to help faculty publish OER. Um, Veronica mentioned her challenges, including the bookstore, a rather fraught relationship with OER because they always want to push their open wrapping platforms or first day initiatives, things like that. Um, Veronica, I put a link in the chat on tips for partnering with your bookstore. Um, Amanda, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, I was really lucky at Penn State that the bookstore was sort of already on the page, but we definitely had a fraught relationship once they started creating their open wrapping program. And what we worked out was that um, we ended up doing sort of like a string of workshops together where they would talk about their open platform and um, and we would then talk about like OER. So the faculty were getting both messages at the same time and we were sharing space together. And, um, but it did, it, it was get, as inclusive access becomes more popular, it was getting more fraught. So um, that is definitely a challenge. And the best I can say is like, do the best you can in that situation. Um, I like, I'm gonna steal Sarah Cohen's thing of like, let's not demonize the bookstore. So make sure that like when you're in meetings, you're not talking poorly about their product necessarily. Um, you can just like hand wave at it and the bookstore has X, Y, Z as an option as well. Um, and now in my role now, um, we do have sort of like an inclusive access program that is run by the Affordable Learning Exchange. So that is also something where it's like, we have to also be mindful to make sure that we mention that this thing exists too. And so what I've been trying to do is balance that with also library resources, which is are, are things that students tuition are already paying for. So here's these library resources and sort of treat it as a spectrum. So there is free on the web, all the way to like inclusive access, which is in a proprietary closed system and make sure that we sort of like define what those different steps are on the way. So there's free things you can link to, there's library resources, there's open educational resources that have XYZ benefits, and then where you also have access to this other program of inclusive access stuff. Thanks, Amanda. So John's question in the chat, how do you approach the issue of incentives besides money for faculty, considering that many don't receive promotion and tenure credit for either textbook writing or OER publications, if they are not intrinsically interested in saving students money, what else could motivate them? 
if they are on the tenure track, I have found talking to them about it as a research opportunity is very successful. So while they might not get credit for writing the thing or using an OER in their classroom, a lot of times it is a giant hole in the research field in their discipline. And so it would provide them a place to really carve out a niche for themselves. And so I talked to them about not only can they publish about this process, um, but also they can sort of like build a name for themselves that way because they're always looking for where they can enter into the conversation and sort of like have the thing that is special to them. And I have had really good success with that. But also I will say it is good to know when to just let a faculty member go. Like, don't feel like you have to always be spending all of your energy to try and convince them. There are other people who will adopt and do the work. So like figuring out that balance is also very useful. Yeah, I really appreciate um, that comment too. It kind of goes along with, you don't have to master everything. Yeah. I think, you know, we, we are impassioned and and want to support everyone or kind of, you know, do what we can for something that we think is um, really valuable. But sometimes it's best to just focus energies on those who are going to meet you part way um, or, you know, give yourself permission to kind of not know what's what's over there and figure it out once you get there or ask other people to support you in that process. So on that note, um, when Amanda was um, giving her presentation, she talked about, you know, common questions that faculty often bring to the table. So I'm going to put a link in the chat and that Google Doc um, is something that's from BC campus. I, I adapted it from um, faculty questions that Lori Aesop created. But these are common questions that faculty authors ask. Um, and some of them may be unique to your program. So you won't find uh, the answers written there, but um, this is uh, helpful in terms of a heads up of, of things that you, you will probably be asked. Let's see, I'm just looking through the chat to see if I've missed anything. Elle had a great suggestion for Veronica. I found doing Creative Commons workshop, including a tool like tineye.com, which does a reverse image search, uh, can open up the discussion nicely. So kind of back to that question of um, how to ensure that that faculty creators are finding truly open materials to use in creating their OER. So we still have some time left. Other questions for Amanda or best case, worst case scenarios that you would kind of like to surface or float out there? The other thing I would say is if you're at sort of the beginning of starting your program, um, figuring out what the intellectual property um, policies are in your institution is also a really great way to start. So a lot of times faculty still retain their copyright, but that might not be true if like their director has ordered them to rake an OER. And um, figuring that out before you get started is really helpful. Um, a lot of times staff works will be the institution's copyright, so they might not be able to pick a license. And um, that's one of those things that can like really bog you down in the weeds later on. Um, so that's a great place to start too, as you're sort of like doing the, the beginning dreaming of your program. Joshua's question in the chat, Google image search can sort by copyright as well. Has anyone sued this function or found that it's accu accurate slash reliable? So I teach folks how to do... Um, okay. <laughs> I was like, is this a legal question? I, I don't answer legal questions. <laughs> um, but I have, I, I teach people how to use Google Advanced Search for just that reason, because you can search by uses rights, but you do have to still do your due diligence and check to make sure things are actually um license the way that it thinks that that is um this is also true of um youtube has a creative commons license filter and um that one is really sketchy you have to really check if the videos there because they tend to throw just anything that's education into that license and it can't it's not actually 
licensed that way. And I've, I've spent a lot of time like reaching out to people and saying, is this video actually a Creative Commons license? And a lot of times the answer is no. But the nice thing about that is like you can still link to it and embed it. I mean, that's all completely usable through and legal. Um, but I don't know about the images, how, like how accurate that is, but those should be a little bit easier to figure out than um, videos. Thanks for your question, Joshua. Other questions, feel free to unmute too if you prefer to have your voice heard. I have a fast question. Mm -hmm. uh, we're early days uh, at my institution and I keep hearing, if you mentioned today, Amanda, several times press books. Can you tell me a little bit, tell us more a little bit about that for those of us who are kind of new to the game? Yeah, um, so Pressbooks is a WordPress based platform. So if you're familiar with that blogging tool um, and site building tool, um, it's sort of built on the same framework, but it started as sort of like a vanity press. Um, so people could self publish their works there. And since folks in academia have sort of really been interested in creating OER, they've really sort of pivoted into um, making Pressbooks support open educational resource publishing um, a lot um, more than necessarily like still keeping the vanity press. Like you can still go to word to pressbooks.com and do the thing there if you want. But um, they, um, it creates um, basically web readable books and in a lot of different formats. So you have a lot of export formats and it is really easy for folks to use. If you use Microsoft Word, you can author inside of Pressbooks. Um, and as it has aged over the years, it has added more things into core Pressbooks. So for example, you might hear about H5P, which is an HTML5 plugin that allows you to make um, formative assessments. So you could do like quizzing or you could do like an image hotspot and those can be embedded directly into the web book. Um, and um, they also have built Hypothesis, which is an annotation layer, is also part of Core Pressbooks now. And so that would allow folks who have Hypothesis accounts to annotate on a book. And there's like a lot of open pedagogy things that you can do with that and build out assignments where like students annotate or you annotate things to help clarify for students. So it has a lot of um, affordances that really take advantage of the web as its um, place that it lives. And um, it's just one of many publishing tools that you could use to create OER. Thanks, Amanda. I would also add that Pressbooks is one of our partners and we do provide a sandbox space for institutional and allied members and then a limited sandbox space decided um, if you're a consortial member, your uh, consortial lead will decide um, which sandbox users to, um, to accommodate. But that is a benefit of your OT, OTN membership. And then we also do um, periodic training and other support. So like the publishing co-op just had three hours of Pressbooks training with Steele and Liz. And um, coming up at OTNSI, which will be online this year, um, we are going to have additional Pressbooks um, training, including how to teach Pressbooks to faculty. So there will be more to come um, that is Pressbooks specific. Catherine says in the chat, I've been following Pressbooks for a while. Seems like it's pretty good with ADA compliance. And the VPAT for H5P lets you see what quiz types are ADA friendly. Thanks, Catherine. Um, and then Deanne is asking if, does anyone know of an updated comparison chart of platforms? This one from three years ago. I look forward to seeing the one from three years ago, Deanne. I know this would be really awesome. I've had conversations with Library Publishing Coalition about it. Um, I don't know if there is one more recent than, um, than what you may be looking at, but I know it wouldn't be really helpful. Um, and I also know that we only have two minutes left, but maybe we can squeeze in John's question. Will any of these Pressbooks trainings be made available to members as a recording or slides later on? 
of course, John, we will definitely do that. Um, so that resource will live forever on YouTube with a CC BY license. So we've come full circle in that conversation. Um, I will also by request um, go ahead and just remove the part of our chat that has all sort of the, the link heavy um, content and I'll put it in our class notes. Know that you also have the option of clicking on those three dots in the bottom right corner of your Zoom screen and sharing the chat that way. I will also add the faculty author FAQs that I put in here. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all next week when we will meet with Carla and talk about MOUs. And uh, Amanda mentioned at the start of her presentation that establishing shared language is really helpful as you get things off the ground with your authors. And so the MOU will help codify that shared language. Amanda also mentioned sitting down with your author and reading through you know, what the plan is rather than emailing them the MOU or the plan. And I, um, I just really want to agree with that. And you'll probably hear the same thing from Carla next week. So please review unit three and you'll find a quiz at the end of that Canvas unit and watch the video implementing a publishing program. And before you go, please join me in thanking Amanda for joining us and thank all of you for your questions and engagement. Until next week, farewell. Thank you as always for having me.